from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Thanks for coming today. Uh, my name is Rob Casper. I'm the head of the Poetry and Literature Center here at the Library of Congress. And I want to welcome you to our final literary birthday celebration of the year, uh, celebrating poet and writer uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Uh, first of all, let me ask you to do the thing that I'm going to do, uh, which is to take out your cell phones if you have them and they're on, and make sure they're turned off, uh, as uh, they will interfere with uh, uh, audio and videotaping of this event. Also, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Poetry and Literature Center here at the library. We are home to the Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry, and we put on uh, literary readings, uh, events, and panels of all sorts throughout the year, um, both afternoon events like this and uh, evening events. If you would like to find out more about our events here at the Poetry and Literature Center, you can sign our sign-up sheet, which is outside of, the, uh, outside of this, uh, this room. You can also visit our website, which is www.loc.gov poetry. Today we are thrilled to honor one of America's brightest lights on what would have been his 141st birthday. You can read about Mr. Dunbar and about our two featured authors, Holly Bass and Al Young, uh, in your print program, which should have been on your seat. Uh, we are thrilled to feature Holly, who's been a big part of the literary scene here in the District of Columbia. And we are also very thankful uh, Al Young has come from across the country and uh, on what was a somewhat difficult flight, uh, uh, given the weather, uh, to be here with us today. A word about the program, uh, our two featured readers will read their favorite uh, Dunbar poems and connect them to their own work. Uh, there's a little mistake on our program. We actually have um, Rosemary Plakas, who is the Americana specialist from our Rare Books and Special Collections Division. And after our readers uh, get up and give their reading, uh, she will come up and talk about the work that the division does to support writers like Paul Ernst Dunbar, and also explain this wonderful display uh, here uh, to my right. Uh, to learn more about Rare Books and sp Special Collections, you can visit their website, which is www.lsc.gov slash rr slash rare book. Uh, we invite you after the reading to come up and check out the books, and also uh, there are books for sale in the back, uh, which you can uh, get and hopefully uh, get, get signed copies from our writers. So uh, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Holly Bass and Al Young. Hi, good afternoon. And I'm going to, um, I'm going to use a timer. Oh wait, that's not right. Okay. All right. Just to make sure I don't go over time. How's everybody feeling today? Excellent, excellent. Um, so it's really, it's really an honor and a delight to be here at the Library of Congress and to be here for this particular occasion to celebrate Paul Lawrence Dunbar. And I want to start with a poem of his called A Choice. It's a short poem. They please me not, these solemn songs, that hint of sermons covered up. It is true the world should heed its wrongs, but in a poem, let me sup, not symbols brewed to cure or ease humanity's confessed disease, but the spirit wine of a singing line or a dewdrop in a honey cup. And I wanted to begin with that poem because I, I think it says so much about, um, about Dunbar and also about poetry, and I just love that um, one particular line, the spirit wine of a singing line. It has such rhythm to it, it has such musicality. And um, I also think that for me, um, poetry is a, a type of song. 
and it's it's a sort of heart song and the kind of song that you can carry with you and I've heard many people lament that we no longer teach children to memorize poems in school. I think it's so nice when you can have those poems by heart that you carry with you and the lines will come back and, and particular phrases. So I wanted to start with a choice. And then in thinking about Dunbar um, and his, his influence on my work, I don't know that I, um, if someone were to have asked me who my influences were, I would probably name more contemporary poets like Gwendolyn Brooks and Robert Hayden. But then I also think that um, because there's this line and legacy, uh, the continuum of black poetry, Dunbar has certainly influenced uh, my writing. And even things that we take for granted, I, I don't think either of us are planning to read sympathy, but even the imagery of the caged bird singing, how much potency that has in our, our contemporary lexicon, you know, um, as a metaphor, as something we know through Maya Angelou, and then as, I think, um, a really apt description for black life in America. So those kinds of things often, you know, uh, we forget about how certain poets' phrases really carry through into our daily lives. So that's something else I like. Um, the other thing that was interesting, going back and looking at um, Dunbar's biography, is, and I think it's a really common story, Maria and I were, were talking as we were walking our way here, and saying, yes, we had the same experience. So Dunbar started writing poems as a child when he was six or seven years old, and his mother instilled in him that love for literature, and I have the exact same story. My mother started teaching me to read when I was three or four years old and just really instilled this love for language. And so I wrote my first poem when I was six years old. And um, I think my first poem was published when I was 10. It was a school newspaper. <laughs> but I was very proud of it. And I still have a copy, you know. And uh, Dunbar also started publishing at a very young age. And then where he surpassed all of us is that he managed to publish, you know, like 25 books before he died at age 34. And so. I will probably never, <laughs> never match that level of prolificness, but it's, it's still nice to think about how, um, how important I think it is to, to give children a love of language and what a gift that is, whether or not you decide to become a professional poet. It's really such a tremendous gift. So I'm going to read um, a really well-known poem by Dunbar, and I'm going to follow up with a, a poem of my own. and. Uh, this poem is one of his dialect poems, and I have to just be honest and say I always feel um, a little bit hesitant <laughs> when I have to read dialect. I was born and raised in California. My parents are Southern, but I was born and raised in California, and then um, my nursery school years were spent in England, so I don't have a really good <laughs> I don't have a really good grasp of Black vernacular dialect. Um, it's, I almost liken it to being um, a, a kind of a first generation uh, immigrant so that, you know, I have these friends that are like, well, my parents speak Tagalog and I understand it, but I don't speak it. You know, we came from the Philippines and so I feel like that, like I understand it better than I speak it. So all of that is a long disclaimer <laughs> before I go into this really wonderful and again, really, really musical poem an antebellum sermon. An antebellum sermon. We is gathered here, my brothers, in this howling wilderness for to speak some words of comfort to each other in distress. And we choose this for our subject this. We'll explain it by and by. And the Lord said, Moses, Moses. And the man said, here am I. Now, old Pharaoh down in Egypt was the worst man ever born, and he had the Hebrew chilling down there working in his comb. To where the Lord got tired of his fooling, and says he, I'll let him know. Look at here, Moses. Go tell Pharaoh for to let them chilling go. And if he refused to do it, I will make him rue the hour. For I'll empty down on Egypt all the vials of my power. Yes, he did. And Pharaoh's army, 
wasn't worth half a dime. For the Lord will help his children. You can trust him every time. And your enemies may sail you in the front and in the back, but the Lord is all around for the battles, for the battle, battles brunt. They can forge your chains and shackles from the mountains to the sea, but the Lord will send some Moses for to set his children free. And the land shall hear his thunder like a blast from Gabriel's horn. For the Lord of hosts is mighty when he girds his armor on. But for fear someone mistakes me, I will pause right here and say that I'm still a preaching ancient I ain't talking about today. But I tell you, fellow Christians, things will happen mighty strange. Now the Lord done this for Israel, and his ways don't never change. And the love he showed to Israel wasn't all on Israel spent. Now don't run and tell your masters that I'm preaching discontent. Because I isn't. I was judging Bible people by their acts. I was giving you the scripture. I was handing you the facts. Because old Pharaoh believed in slavery. But the Lord, he let him see that the people he put breath in, every mother's son was free. And there's others think like Pharaoh, but they call the scripture liar. For the Bible says a servant is a worthy of his hire. And you can't get round, no through that, and you can't get over it. For whatever place you get in, this here Bible too will fit. So you see, the Lord's intention ever since the world begun was that his almighty freedom should belong to every man. But I think it would be better if I pause again to say that I'm talking about our freedom in a Bibleistic way. <laughs> but the Moses is a coming, and he's coming sure and fast. We can hear his feet are stomping. We can hear his trumpet blast. But I want to warn you people, don't you get too briggedy. And don't you get to bragging about these things. You wait and see. But when Moses, with his power, comes and sets us chilling free, we will praise the gracious master that has given us liberty. And we'll shout our hallelujahs on that mighty reckoning day when we recognized as citizens. Huh, children, let us pray. And um, I just love things like Bibleistic, you know, in a Bibleistic way. So I'm going to just read one poem of my own, and it's called uh, Modern English. And I, I just finished a manuscript. I was telling Rob Casper and sent it out to the contests, the ether, the mystical world of who knows when I'll hear back. <laughs> um, so this poem is from that manuscript. It's called Modern English. Why do lots of black people say ax instead of ask? Anonymous on the web forum wants to know. Theories abound, but the truth is rather complex. Metathesis. How tongues shape sounds, hold centuries of hard habit, how it becomes comfortable, even integral to our being. No need to visit colonial Williamsburg and peer at white folk and knee breeches. The hood has all the middle English you could ever want. <laughs> but why reverse the S and K anyway? When came the break? Perhaps when slavery metastasized into Jim Crow, eager to scrub the records clean secret meetings of the new American English society decided it was no longer relevant but irrelevant. <laughs> Call in the Calibri. The revolution is about to get linguistic. Mm -hmm. So act like you know. And if you don't know, you better ask somebody. <laughs> So I had, a, I had a lot of fun writing that <laughs> and researching it. I use Google a lot when I'm working on poems, and I'll come across a word that I don't know, or just um, there really was a question, you know, someone asked. 
and the answer was so surprising to me that a lot of uh, black speech patterns are actually, and it makes sense, they're old Middle English that were picked up from the slave masters and sort of preserved in the same way that you can you know, go to Brazil and see a lot of preserved African spiritual traditions or go to North Carolina and see a lot of you know, preserved African traditions. That's um, the way we use our tongues is a uh, whole centuries whole centuries of history and music. So I'm going to do just two more um, Dunbar poems and make way for Al Young. So excited. I didn't know he was going to be on the bill when they invited me. So I was like, well, sure. You know, I'll be in town. I'd be delighted to come. And then it was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so let's see. This is called Dreams. And he has at least two poems with the same title, so this is What Dreams We Have. What dreams we have and how they fly, like rosy clouds across the sky, of wealth, of fame, of sure success, of love that comes to cheer and bless, and how they wither, how they fade, the waning wealth the jilting jade, the fame that for a moment gleams and flies forever, dreams, ah, dreams. Oh, burning doubt and long regret, oh, tears with which our eyes are wet, heart throbs, heart aches, the glut of pain, the somber cloud, the bitter rain. You were not of these dreams, ah, well, your full fruition, who can tell? Wealth, fame, and love, ah, love that beams upon our souls, all dreams, ah, dreams. And I didn't, I didn't look up the date of that poem, but it strikes me that perhaps it was one of the poems written toward the end of his life when he himself was experiencing the waning of his own fame and the loss of love um, that came and we were talking earlier um, in the office uh, partly about how prolific um, Dunbar was to have only lived 34 years. And I've, I've always felt that um, artists and, and great figures who do die young, I, I think sometimes they know whether it's you know, a painter like Jean-Michel Basquiat or a leader like uh, Martin Luther King Jr. I think folks like that know they're not long for the earth, and so they, they really burn their creative energy at a much higher pace. I plan to live to be 95, so I'm just taking my own sweet time. But um, uh, I just I think about that and what it must be like to have um, been so internationally famous and then to struggle so in your final years. Um, so it's, you know, perhaps, perhaps there's some tragedy to that story, but... Um, also a great intensity and what a great body of work he left. And so now I will leave you a little short. Am I? All right. Um, if it's not working, I can, is this a recording mic? And this is, okay. Well, I think I'll, I'll project for the audience if the mic comes on, I'll, I'll adjust again, but it, it seems to be kind of fading in and out. Uh, so this is a final poem. Invitation to love. Come when the nights are bright with stars or when the moon is mellow. Come when the sun, his golden bars, drops on the hayfield yellow. Come in the twilight, soft and gray. Come in the night or come in the day. Come, O oh love whene'er you may, and you are welcome, welcome. You are sweet, O oh love, dear love, you are soft as the nesting dove. Come to my heart and bring it rest, as a bird's fly home to its welcome nest. Come when my heart is full of grief, or when my heart is merry. Come with the falling of the leaf, or with the reddening cherry. Come when the years first blossoms 
blows. Come when the summer gleams and glows. Come with the winter's drifting snows. And you are welcome. Welcome. Thank you. And now I'd like to welcome Al Young to the podium. Good afternoon. Hey. You realize that before there was Q&A, there was call and response. <laughs> Not all audiences understand that. Like Holly and uh, perhaps like uh, Mr. Dunbar, the great Paul Lawrence Dunbar, uh, I was one of those kids who paid attention to everything and knew how to read by the time I was three years old. And that combined with growing up <clears throat> in a village in Mississippi, Pachuta, Mississippi, uh, in the 1940s, uh, that was fairly isolated. Uh, it wasn't that far from Meridian, but we had no running water, no electricity. And my curmudgeonly grandfather, Jordan Campbell, ran his 90-acre farm uh, with mules and wagons and man-navigated uh, plows and that sort of thing, which chased all of his, most of his nine children away. <laughs> I spent my second grade in Laurel, Mississippi, uh, living with my aunt Doris, my mother's uh, sister, and her husband, uh, who hard to figure out what Cleve did, but he had a taxi cab company, but he also, in the dry state of Mississippi, was running what they called in those days a blind pig uh, out of the house, that is, selling uh, liquor illegally. Uh, it was quite a, quite a, it's almost as if, if I were to choose to become a writer, I had selected the perfect childhood <laughs> for, for, for color and dash. But my second grade uh, teacher, uh, Miss Eloise Chapman, at the uh, Kingston elementary school for colored is the one who made us memorize uh, poetry uh, in general and uh, the poetry of uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar and James Weldon Johnson and Langston Hughes uh, in particular and she was quite uh, quite something I think we had to memorize a poem every two weeks and when I think about this we were in the second grade that means we could read and so I've always been baffled by, you know, all of this reading uh, problem that's, that's developed since then. But Miss Chapman was, uh, was one of those tough old one-room school teachers. You had her all day. She taught everything, history, math, uh, literature, whatever. And she said, you're going to have to learn how to be twice as good as white people because you already got a handicap on you. And you're going to have to learn to speak well, and you're going to have to learn to read well and to think was one of those teachers who would uh, try to kill you if you were talking <laughs> and she was speaking and she would look over in that corner but she'd have one of those hard block wood block erasers not these uh, these soft ones now that are made out of felt and she would look this way but she would try to hit you over there and she'd look over here and she was pretty good and she always said to me I'm going to be harder on you than anybody else because I expect a lot from you uh, for years, I misremembered a Paul Lawrence Dunbar poem. It's the poem called In the Morning, which I'll, I'll get to part of uh, in this presentation. Uh, but it opens with the lines, uh, it's a mother speaking to a, a sort of slow rising sun, S-O-N. Lies, lies, bless the Lord, don't you know the days abroad? If you don't get up from there, you scamp, there'll be trouble in this camp. Wash your face, comb your head, look just like a feather bed. Lord, have mercy on our souls. Don't you dare touch them rolls. Now, that's a mashup that comes from different parts of that poem, but that's the way the mature Al Young misremembered that poem. And I was shocked when I went back and looked at the whole long poem which, in which those lines occur. But uh, it's amazing how memory uh, works. And, one of the things I, uh, I must 
uh, explain before I begin reading uh, Mr. Dunbar's work is that in the 19th century, poetry was crucial uh, to American life. Uh, one of the people who writes about this uh, in, a, in a, an illuminating way is uh, Dana Joya, uh, the former uh, head of the National Endowment uh, for the Arts, uh, in his book of a couple of decades back called Can Poetry Matter? That's the title of the book, in which he points out that uh, poetry was, was the popular entertainment of the day in, in American homes all through all the classes, lower class, middle class, upper class. There was nothing else happening. Remember now, people didn't have electric lights or television or radio and all of that. And they would recite poems to each other. And I was very lucky to get in on some of that uh, in my upbringing because uh, in this village of Pachuda, people could, uh, there were people who knew the whole Bible by heart that I only found out uh, when I got grown that they couldn't read. You know, they'd, mem they'd memorize the whole thing. So that poetry was just a natural part of life. It also appeared in, 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 in uh, popular magazines and in daily newspapers. Uh, I first uh, read Langston Hughes in the pages of, of the Pittsburgh Courier. Uh, poets got rich. Uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, you had to have three names in those days, you know, <laughs> Paul Lawrence Dunbar, you know. uh, John uh, Green, James Greenleaf Whittier, uh, they, all, they got rich uh, writing poetry. And, that sounds absurd now because people think that poetry is just a losing proposition. It's just something you do on the side. But it was not only uh, a form of entertainment, but it was the great repository of, of history, uh, of social uh, development. Uh, it was used for teaching, for philosophizing. It had many uses uh, in, in the 19th century. And this is where we find uh, Paul Dunbar's locate his, his popularity. The other thing that you have to put with that uh, is that American entertainment forms have always made fun of uh, ethnicities. Uh, always the dialect jokes. Sometimes they were Jewish, sometimes they were Greek, sometimes they were German, sometimes they were Dutch, and a lot of the time they were black. And that, that, that aspect of American entertainment uh, has not abandoned us. So that you get Paul Lawrence Dunbar uh, writing these, these dialect poems, and towards the end of his life really feeling depressed about a lot of things, but one of the things, and, and I'll read a poem that addresses that, it's his poem, uh, The Poet, uh, that his dialect poems were superbly popular, whereas his proper Victorian uh, poems uh, didn't get as much of a spotlight. And that kind of got on, got on him for a while. Yeah, I got lots of notes here, I'm gonna skip them. <clears throat> I had a long presentation and when Rob Casper told me by telephone before I left California, 20 minutes, I said, whoa, I got to really cut this down. The lyrics are by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. The music is by Oscar Brown Jr. I'm not going to do the whole poem, but just enough to give you the flavor of how, how musical uh, Dunbar's work is. Go away and quit that noise, Miss Lucy. Put that music book away. What's the use to keep on trying? If you practice well, you gray. You can't start no notes of flying like the one that rants and rings from the kitchen to the big woods when Melinda sings. You ain't got the natural organs for to make the sound come right. You ain't got the turns and twistings for to make it sweet and light. Tell you one thing now, Miss Lucy, and I'm telling you for true, when it comes to real right singing, when Melinda sings. I could go on and on like that. Uh, he wrote lots of, lots of, uh, <laughs> lots of poems uh, about music. Oh, I skipped one of the, the, the best ones. Uh, When it comes to real right singing, tain't no easy thing to do. Easy enough for folks to holler, looking at the lines and dots. When they ain't got, let's see, when they ain't no one can sense it, and the tune comes in in spots. But for real below just music, that just strikes your head and clings. Just you stay and listen with me when Melinda sings, and so forth. He wrote uh, long poems. Long poems were very popular then because uh, quite often they were narratives. 
Uh, I think a lot of us uh, had to read things like Evangeline, uh, Hiawatha, when we were growing up. The lyric side of Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Uh, this poem makes me think of uh, a later uh, song that entered the American uh, panoply. It, it's uh, Jerome Kern and Oscar Hammerstein II uh, uh, wrote the lyric. Um, you are the promised kiss of springtime that makes the lonely winter seem long, and so forth. A song, Paul Lawrence Dunbar. <clears throat> Thou art the soul of a summer's day. Thou art the breath of the rose. But the summer is fled, and the rose is dead. Where are they gone? Who knows? Who knows? Thou art the blood of my heart of hearts. Thou art my soul's repose. But my heart grows numb and my soul is dumb. Where art thou, love? Who knows? Who knows? Thou art the hope of any, I'm sorry, thou art the hope of my after years, sun for my winter snows. But the years go by neath a clouded sky. Where shall we meet? Who knows? Who knows? One day my happy arms will hold you. And one day I'll know that moment divine when all the things you are, they will be mine. Same kind of sentiment. Uh, we think of, of poems as being original creations. And I like to point out to uh, my students when I teach poetry that uh, the eye was it took a long time for the eye to come in and dominate poetry. And a lot of these conventions that are passed down from century to century, uh, we, don't, we don't see them as uh, musicians might hear them as licks. There were certain licks that were just passed down from decade to decade. So there are a lot of uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar licks in uh, 20th century uh, poetry. Let's go to another poem that I alluded to here. This is the way uh, In the Morning properly begins. Lies, lies, bless the Lord, don't you know the days abroad? If you don't get up, you scamp, there'll be trouble in this camp. Tink I gwine to let you sleep while I makes your board and keep? That's a putty howdy do. Don't you hear me, lies, you? But if I come across this floor, you won't find no time to snow. Daylight all a shining in while you sleep? Well, it's a sin. Ain't the candle light enough to burn out without a snuff? But you go the morning through, burning up the daylight too. Lies, don't you hear me call? No use turning towards the wall. I can hear that mattress squeak. Don't you hear me when I speak? This here clock done struck off six. Callan, bring me them now sticks. Oh, you down, sir, huh, you down. Look here, don't you dare to frown. That's the kind of thing that uh, people loved because you could do these dramatic narratives and people could deliver them. And uh, that was a form of entertainment that I think has returned in, in a sense in, uh, in performance poetry of today and uh, some branches of progressive hip hop. The poet. He sang of life serenely sweet with now and then a deeper note from some high peak nigh yet remote. He voiced the world's absorbing beat. He sang of love when earth was young and love itself was in his lays. But ah, the world, it turned to praise a jingle in a broken tongue. That's uh, one of his poems in which uh, I imagine him being self-reflective and being very disappointed that uh, people only like these, these dialect poems that were quite often uh, funny and sometimes ironically so. And sometimes when you look beneath, beneath the language of those poems uh, uh, in the same way that, what was the word, bibalistic, 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 you get that same kind of irony uh, going on. In fact, uh, in one of his 
his most famous poems, uh, he talks about uh, that aspect of, of um, African American uh, behavior and culture. I thought I brought it. Eh, maybe I didn't. We wear the mask. Um, pretty sure it's here. No, I didn't bring it. I'll bet you somebody out here knows it by heart. No, don't, don't Google it. If you're back there at the table, would you bring me a copy of something about the blues? Uh, the influence of Paul Lawrence Dunbar on me uh, is incalculable, but one of the things that I became aware of growing up as someone who had learned to read uh, at an early age and also listen to all of those, the rich storytelling, thank you, going on around me. Oh, okay. You want to? It's got the whole thing here. Uh, why don't you find, um, yeah. Uh, oh, okay. But I don't want to touch that rare book. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't. See, 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 the, see the, the sentiments that, that librarians instill in you at an early age. <laughs> I'll hold it, and you can read it. <laughs> You're presuming I can. Here, I'm not that bad. I, I'll be careful with it. Got another pair of glasses in my <laughs> Let's see if I can read it. Not that one, but the other case. There's a black one. Okay. Nope, that's my camera. Thank you. This might help. This is the art of jazz. Improvisation. This is it. We wear the mask. We wear the mask that grins and lies. It hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. This debt we pay to human guile with torn and bleeding hearts, we smile and mouth with myriad subtleties. Why should the world be overwise in counting all our tears and sighs? Nay, let them only see us while we wear the mask. We smile, but, oh, great Christ, our cries to thee from tortured souls arise. We sing, but, oh, that, day, that clay is vile beneath our feet and long the mile. But let the world dream otherwise. We wear the mask. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. So my own work, um, from an early age, I was consciously aware that there were different languages within the language that we call uh, English, <clears throat> so that uh, I, I observed that many African Americans, people in my family and, and community, uh, were multilingual. Uh, there's, there's more than one African American language. Uh, you had people like Dan Doris, who was so... Uh, self-conscious about this, that she would say marking bird instead of mocking bird because she wanted to you know, get it right. And you had people like my late Aunt May who died two years ago when I was talking about Paul Lawrence Dunbar to her. Uh, she was, had just turned 90 at the time. She said, Dunbar, Dunbar, that strikes a chord. Oh yeah, I remember him. He's the one that brought all that D's and dits and this and that. <laughs> uh, uh, into our community. No, he's got to go. You know, so, so he, was, he was controversial. Not everybody, not everybody approved of him. But uh, <clears throat> I've written a, a, quite a number of, of poems in what used to be called dialect, uh, in what later came to be called black vernacular. And uh, I even invented a poet named O.O. Gabuga <laughs> during the black militant days uh, who was making fun of hypocrisy in that particular movement. And this is uh, one of the poems that I still love to uh, present, and it's inspired very directly by the ballad style of, of Paul Lawrence Dunbar. I wasn't planning to do this, but after I heard Holly do hers, I thought, well, let's try it. Uh, conjugal visits. Uh, the background to the poem 
uh, I was teaching in a program called uh, Community Studies. Uh, it's, it was a multi-disciplinary uh, uh, program at UC uh, Santa Cruz, and it was a work-study program. The kids would, the graduate students there would work for uh, uh, six months, and they'd come back to school for six months, and then they'd have to write about it, uh, their work experience. And there was one young sister who was uh, trying to get off welfare. She was middle-aged, and uh, she was trying to get a degree to get out of that, that, that trap. And she would always excuse herself once a month because uh, it was visiting day at the Q uh, at San Quentin at that time. This is the late 80s, was experimenting with conjugal visits. So this poem comes from her voice. By noon, we'll be deep into it, up reading out loud in bed, or in between our making love, I'll paint my toenails red. Reese say he got to change his name from Maurice to Malik. He think I need to change mine too, conversion, so to speak. I ain't no Muslim yet, I say. Besides, I like my name. Kamisha still sounds good to me. I'll let you play that game. I'd rather play with you, he say, than trip back to the 60s. The 60s, eh? I'm on his case that I won't do my strip tease. This brother look at me and laugh. He know I love him bad. And worse, he know exactly how much loving I ain't had. He grab me by my puffed up waist and pull me to him close. He say, I want you in my face or on my face, Miss Toes. That's what it says here. What can I say? I'd lie for Reese, but I'm not quitting school. Four miles to feed, not counting mine. Let urban studies rule. I met him in the won't ads. We fell in love by mail. I say when people bring this up, what no one up for sale? All these black men crammed up in jail, all this IQ on ice, while governments, bank presidents, the mafia don't think twice. They fly in dope and make real show their hands stay nice and clean. The chump change Reese made on the street, what's that supposed to mean? For what it costs the state to keep you locked down, clothed, and fed, you could be learning Harvard stuff and brilliant skills. I said, Reese say, just kiss me one more time, then let's get down, make love, then let's devour that special meal I wish they'd serve more of. They say the third time out's a charm. I kind of think they're right. My first, he was the ace of swords, which didn't make him no knight. <clears throat> Excuse me. He gave me Zeus and Brittany. My second left me twins. This third one ain't about no luck. We're honeymooners, friends. I go see Maurice once a month while moms looks after things. We'd be so glad to touch again. I dance, he grins, he sings. When I get back home to my kids, schoolwork, the copy shop, ain't no way Reese can mess with me. They got his ass locked up. <laughs> <laughs> I had the, uh, the honor of, of uh, serving as a kind of the moderator of, a, uh, a, I think, a four uh, D DVD set that a uh, former baseball player named Samuel Reese uh, produced. You can Google it and find it. Uh, and it's about the life of, um, of Paul Lawrence Dunbar. And uh, I really admired the producer, Mr. Reese, because he, he did it on his modest income. And he managed to get Sonia Sanchez and... Uh, Mary Baraka and just all kinds of uh, people, Alice Walker, uh, performing uh, on this video, uh, the, the work of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, who regrettably uh, led kind of the classic poet's life. He died young, he produced a lot, and was largely uh, forgotten and even scorned <clears throat> until time passes. And now uh, we're recognizing him properly as one of the great American writers. Thank you. We did it. <laughs> wow, this has been quite a celebration, hasn't it? And thank you for all. Thank you all for um, to coming to help us celebrate it. 
Um, I selected a few of um, the uh, works of um, Paul Lawrence Dunbar that we have in the Rare Book Division, and I hope that you will be able to come and, uh, and look at some of them. Um, alas, his first book, Oak and Ivy, which he published a couple of years after he, he graduated from high school. Well, 90, or actually he's published in 93, but he probably wrote a lot of it. 1893. Um, was done with the help of his high school friend, um, Orville Wright, and was published by the uh, United Brethren Publishing House, which uh, Orville Wright's father was the bishop of the United Brethren uh, Church, which had its headquarters in, in, in Dayton. Uh, it, it, we understand that uh, he uh, was able to sell enough copies of that first work. Uh, there were t only 500 published. 250 of them were uh, burned in a fire, so that leaves only 250. And alas, we do not have a copy of that first work, but there is a copy available by a reputable dealer for $4,500. So I welcome uh, anyone who would like to donate that first work <laughs> to the Rare Book Division. We do have his second uh, collection of poems, uh, Majors and Minors, and um, uh, it's on the very far end of the table. It was published, again, copyrighted in 95, published in 1896, early in the year. And on Dunbar's birthday in uh, March of that year, in the, um, the, um, uh, one of the literary critics in Harper's, Harper's Weekly published a very positive review of um, Dunbar's works, alas, focusing more on the uh, dialect poetry than on the standard English poetry, uh, much later to the uh, uh, lament of uh, uh, Dunbar himself, who always thought that his, his standard English poems were the strongest of, of his uh, collections. Uh, but within the, at the end, before the end of the year, though, he had also published um, his, a compilation of, uh, of, his, of the poems that were from those first two works. And it was from that book um, that uh, Professor Young uh, read the, the, the book, the, the poem uh, about the mask. Uh, it, uh, it also included the Ode to Ethiopia, which he had read uh, to uh, Douglas, to uh, Douglas, uh, Frederick Douglass when he worked for him at the, um, the World Columbian Exposition in Chicago in, uh, uh, 1893, and also the, uh, the eulogy that he wrote to uh, Frederick Douglass, which is open for you to look at, um, look at there. He then went on a tour, a reading tour of England in the winter of 96, 97, and when he returned uh, was uh, appointed to a position here at the Library of Congress where he worked for about 15 months. And it was during that time, at the end of 97 and during uh, 1898, that he also published um, two works. His first novel, uh, which uh, we have a copy of, and his first collection of short stories, um, the, the Folks of, of Dixie. And it was partially as a result of working at the library that he was able to um, marry in uh, March of, of, uh, of 1898. And then he continued to write, and by the end of that 15 months, uh, because of his health, his health was deteriorating, and because he wanted to spend all of his time writing, uh, he left the library at the end of 98. The, uh, also, we have uh, here a, a number of his, his dialect poems that uh, included uh, the photography of um, the Hampton Institute Photography uh, Club and were uh, also bound by some of the most noted uh, cover designers of the day. 
and uh, so that these all um, are sh uh, illustrations of uh, how his work was received. Most of the dialect poems that were published in the later years were reprints of things that had been done earlier. Um, but um, and then his, the, his last, we also have his last work, which was published during the year that he died, uh, Joggin' Ere Long, that um, was dedicated to an old friend, which he had reconnected with when he went back to live in Dayton at the end of his life, uh, William Boucher, who had apparently aided him in the publication of his first work. So that this had come kind of full circle. So I hope in the few minutes left that you will come up and take a look at the books that we have. And uh, remember, if you have a friend that has a little <laughs> extra money, we would love to have that first work as part of the library celebration of uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.